Welcome to Quest, a journey to wellness. My name is V, aka Vanessa. I'm a two spirit human, joy influencer, energy worker, and dad joke connoisseur. All pronouns accepted. And my name is Alina. I use she, her pronouns. I am a cat lady, queer, your empirical evidence bay, and I like to keep it funky, 420, and am often guilty of romanticizing. Come on a quest to find out what wellness really means. You'll hear stories from queer folks and allies who've successfully taken their happiness and well-being into their own hands by examining what they have found helpful along the way. If you're curious about wellness, this is our open platform for queer stories, interesting science, and other folks' alternative wellness practices. QUEST is an acronym, Q for queers, sharing wellness experiences. U, understanding, understanding the past, present, and future, and how that impacts our wellness. E, education, the source, evidence, and resources behind the truth. S is for storytelling, powerful and courageous stories from our community leaders and more. The T is for transformation, because self-discovery and care is a lifelong journey. We hope this podcast brings you joy, where you'll learn, laugh, heal, and grow. Welcome back, queer kittens. I'm Alina, and we're taking a look at Community is the Cure, Part 2. V, how's your week been? Is there any uh, wellness highlights you want to share? Actually, there is. I tried yoga for the first time. Holy moly. Oh. And then I'm totally going to butcher this. I It's like vinyasa, I believe. And I thought this whole time yoga was like stretching, like feeling good and just slow movements and just doing a thing. And then she's like, Next position, next position, downward, upward, uh, around the house, and I don't know, all these different names. And I'm like, (laughs) what is going on? We were just at that move. Now we're at this move, (laughs) like trying to keep up. But apparently she thought that I had done yoga before because I was keeping up. And in my brain, the whole time I was like a step behind the whole time. But it was great. It was great. It was like a workout. That's beautiful. I I love that realization when, you know, in your head, as you're going through the process, you have this whole other narrative built up about like how you're doing it. And then someone else who was there is like, no, that's not what I saw at all. (laughs) I saw you kicking ass. You were doing the damn thing. That's awesome. Yeah. And I was always like, hell, like scared to try yoga because the idea of like really stretching out your body. I know the type of person I am. I am not quiet. If I stretch and it feels good, I'm going to be like, <laughs> ah. So the thought of like doing that in the middle of like this like Zen yoga, everyone's quiet, <laughs> you know, and then what if I fart? Everyone's going to know. <laughs> <laughs> like that makes me super nervous, but it, it went well. That's amazing. I um, If you're interested, so there's free yoga when next time you're in Long Beach, there's free yoga at Bluff Park twice a day and like 50 people come out like twice a day, 50 to 100. And people get into it. Like when when we exhale, we exhale like it's a group experience and like people are loud and getting into it. So I think that's a worthwhile thing. You got to We got to give that a go next time you're out here. That definitely sounds like my vibe. Yeah, uh, it was a a free yoga class for me because I'm kind of interning at a queer gym with one of my friends, Yvonne, at Active Fit Gym in Berkeley. They brought on a yoga instructor and I was like, I got to try this out. It was fantastic. What about your weekend? Didn't you just get back from New York recently? Got back from New York? Yeah, uh, a week. Uh, a week or two ago man time what is that (laughs) but it was great yeah definitely strange to be I was there under the pretense of vacation my partner was there for work and then we did a little vacation part in Brooklyn together but it's weird to be in Manhattan resting because it's such a like frantic go city you know and it's like I'm there to chill and I did (laughs) (laughs) so to just be casually walking around is a is a very interesting vibe. 
I definitely enjoyed it. And I think I found out I have a little bit more grit and ability to exist out there than I maybe thought. I've always thought I was a little too sensitive for New York. But. Nah, <laughs> you are your mother's daughter. You can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> we got on just fine. <laughs> yeah. W- was there anything out there that like stuck out in terms of wellness for you? You said you were in the hustle bustle of it and you were able to rest. What did that look like for you? You know, it it was a lot of just like for the first time being like, what do I want to do today? You know, I haven't been in New York for like 10 years. And, you know, I went for the first time with my dad and it was like this big special thing. It's 10 years later. So uh, I'm an adult now. What I'm able to do even is just entirely different. I realized kind of what my like reset period is a little bit and it's like I could go for two days but then I really need like a solid day of actual resting not doing a lot of socializing and like I didn't know that about myself like all this time you know like that's that could have been very useful information (laughs) at various points but uh yeah I don't know kind of taking deliberate time to figure that stuff out is very worthwhile. I had to live deliberately out there, let's say. Nice. That sounds fantastic. Got to get to know yourself a little bit more without work in your for forward motion. I was right. going to say your rear view mirror, but I was like, wait, no, that's totally what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Blocking my whole view. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the road is clear. All right. So, V, what what do we have on the pod for today? Ooh, pod. I like the fact that you called that pod. Never heard it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) But yeah, for those of you who didn't check out episode one, we were gracefully able to interview the founder of uh, Some of Us Fest, which is a wellness festival that y'all should definitely look up more into because it is quite the experience. And while we were there, we got to interview loads of people and hear their wellness experiences, their stories. There was so much absolute queer joy and just honestly, it was, I, I want to say more of like a, a balance of, of dark and light together, of that yin and yang together of people's stories that just made the darkness, made the light shine brighter. There was just so much goodness that we had to pack this into two episodes. In that, like the community, there was just so much love and so much, keep getting lost of words because I'm getting overwhelmed and like butterflies in my chest thinking about like the community (laughs) and the energy and the love. And just the whole experience, I'm like traveling there again. (laughs) (laughs) It's like a rapture. Yeah. I say let the fact that it is a two episode endeavor speak to the fact that there's community for everyone. There's an abundance of amazing people out there who just want to celebrate with you, want to hang out with you, want to enjoy the light and the dark times. I think we we literally found that out by kind of just recounting and like, you know, talking to our community about wellness. Yeah, definitely. And speaking about our community, we wouldn't have this podcast if it wasn't for the community. Most of us, aside from me and you, we are fam. Alina and I are for real cousins. Uh, everyone else on the podcast, whole group, this whole team, Corey, Stevie, Rafaela, and Leah, like we met them all in the nightlife. And without the nightlife, like, I feel like the queer community wouldn't be anything like it is today. Yeah, it's it's really like such a space where so much of the culture has to be safe. Yeah. Us creating this podcast, like it gives us and gives our community like another space to kind of hang out and hear other voices like theirs, stories like theirs, you know, not just convene over, you know, the watering hole. <laughs> yeah, and that's huge. I mean, not everybody has the glowing personality for the daily nightlife. That's a that's a special one for folks who just have that kind of warmth that radiates out of them. 
I got like a two day battery as we previously discussed. I need like one one day hermit mode. Next days can outpour and then need to bring it back. But yeah, that's a uh, it's so huge that we're able to expand those spaces. That makes me think of uh, our lovely producer, Leah Jackson. She's going to be in this lovely episode today because she was the one who did the interviews of our two guests that we have today. I got to meet her in the nightlife. She was a DJ and I went up to her and asked her for a (laughs) mixtape. And that was the beginning of our friendship. Love that. It was an actual CD of a mixtape back then, which I still have. (laughs) <laughs> our our friendship blossomed into like beyond a friendship like you've seen her she's come to the family gatherings and she's like i'm in her will <laughs> you know like no. it, there is no getting away f- from each other and we spent a lot of time in quarantine together we learned how important that rest is because often before quarantine we were both burning the candle at both ends just doing doing it and doing it we were just like tacos movie cool and we would just stay in yes and not feel bad about not going out so and she's that's key. that is true hey. that is true hey, hey, hey. Burr, D, burr, burr. D was my first fan ever of being a <laughs> dj she used to sneak into queer clubs in san francisco and when she was underage nonetheless and i would hand her all my new new mixtapes and you know we just knew each other through nightlife for the through the years and then and then yeah we started having quite quite the bond about six years ago and traveled to europe together in hawaii right before the pandemic hit well i love you b aka daddy i love you so much you're so special to me and i call b daddy because she's got serious dad vibes all, all over her energy. Including the bod. <laughs> dad bod, dad on. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, daddy does get my dog if anything happens. So she is officially in the will. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Speaking of Puka, that's what, you're, that's what you named your uh, company after. That beautiful little angel. <laughs> <laughs> The little angel that V is referring to is my dog, Puka. And yes, I did name my company after my dog. (laughs) Last year, I started my own business and Puka Puka Creative is a creative agency and we make podcasts for companies. Yeah, so it's been quite the journey of starting that this last year. Lots to learn, so... Yeah, Stevie is the executive producer, one of the executive producers of the podcast. And I were talking about Noco Chocolates and um, we're like, we should do a podcast together. So here we are. And Stevie and Corey, who's also the executive producer of this podcast, um, you know, we all met through Nightlife too. And it's just pretty cool to see this like journey for all of us from starting out in Nightlife in the club and really creating those friendships to begin with to now we're all really like in a different place than we were maybe 10 years ago and have all kind of gone on these different wellness journeys separately and together a pretty magical experience working with everybody and I'm I'm just really excited uh, that we're doing this for the community for the queer community definitely definitely I'm gonna snap snap to that one right (laughs) Hey, you even starting your company was almost an act of wellness for yourself. You know, a couple of years ago, I got pretty sick with two autoimmune diseases. Um, one of them being Hashimoto's disease, which is a thyroid disease where it basically attacks your immune system. And I was very sick for about four years. And I had been DJing full time for about 10 years just kind of had this point in my life where I need to really focus on my health and getting better and nightlife and DJing was kind of hindering that that healing process of just being out late and drinking and extracurricular activities that I was doing. And so, yeah, I had to kind of shift gears in my career and what I was doing in my job and really fell in love with audio storytelling. 
um, really is what podcasting is all about. I love the creative aspect of finding stories that I'm really passionate about, finding companies that are doing good work in this world and really want to help them to brand themselves in the audio space. And, and yeah, I'm just really fortunate that I was able to find podcasting and kind of take the risk to start my own company and this endeavor. So it's not easy at all. You know, in our first episode, we talked to Madison, who was the founder of some of this festival. And, you know, she's kind of talking about the same thing. It's like, there's so many risks involved, but it, at the end of the day, those risks are worth it. Finances will go away and struggles and, and all of those things. And it's very stressful, but it's like the best stress I feel like for myself and kind of what, what I need for my wellness, but also for my mental health in this last couple of years. Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, and you're so good at it. Like this whole process has been so easy and I thought it was going to involve so much more. <laughs> like you make it seem like it's so easy. Well, thank you. Oh, <laughs> like for <much. laughs> I appreciate it. This team is is amazing. We're all so excited to, you know, share the stories that we had to share and the experience of being at some of us festival with the two of you and also with Corey and Rafaela, who's our podcast daddy, was one of the most memorable kind of times in, in my life. I mean, it was the first festival that I ever got to DJ at. So that was huge, you know, just from a personal kind of goal standpoint. And it was also like a moment where I saw Madison had this idea five years ago and it finally being, you know, like a real thing and being able to see people that I hadn't seen in two, over two years, like, and some of those people had transitioned and I hadn't got to see, you know, them since they transitioned. One of those people being Kenny, who we have on this episode and, you know, being able to like have Olga T in our camp being able to talk to talk to her and to be able to just sit down and kind of talk about wellness and where we are all, all are at in our wellness journeys. That was kind of really the intention behind these interviews at the festival. And I mean, I was literally crying the whole entire time. Like you said, the, it was like this queer joy that I don't think I've ever felt before in like the ultimate space of safety. And yeah, it was just, it was just so magical. You know, the people that are listening to the podcast will be able to experience that, you know, next year when they have the next festival. These interviews were kind of a very organic thing. When we were talking about doing this, this podcast, one of the things that I was like, the idea that I had was like, hey, we're all going to be at this festival together. Like, can we record some people and really find out like, what does wellness mean to you? Like, what does wellness mean to us as a community? Like there's, it's so big in what wellness means, right? And just being with people and being able to reconnect and to find out like, what are the most important kind of things that impact our wellness as queer, as queer folks? And that, you know, that we really were able to take that and to make, make the content in this, in the, in this podcast and came out with a lot of themes and I'm one being community and how important that is to our well being and our safety and our ability to thrive as a community. And we obviously were able to do that during the pandemic and in, in the physical sense, but but yeah, you know, this first interview we have is with Olga V, who you've been friends with for many years as well. Yeah, I met her while I was working at El Rio. She was DJing at one of my favorite parties, Mango. And I did similarly what I did with you. I went up to her and was like, yo, you're a badass DJ. I want to follow you at every event you go to, whether it was in Oakland or San Francisco, I was there just vibing, just shaking my ass. <laughs> it's very easy to shake your ass when DJ Olga oh, T is yeah, in the house. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and then we like became brothers, and we skateboard and shoot bow and arrows at haystacks. <laughs> nice. 
Sounds awesome. I thought you were going to say you're going to shoot boners. Boners. <laughs> 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 Lady boners. <laughs> Lady boners. <laughs> Queer boners. I was like, that definitely may or may not happen. May or may not happen. You won't be able to see it because it's a podcast <laughs> anyway. So <laughs> Olga is a very special person in the Bay Area, you know, nightlife. Um, when I was first starting out as a, a DJ, you know, it's very overwhelming. The Bay Area is a very vast and big community. And I still remember it. I was DJing at Key Bar. Um, which is in the Castro in San Francisco. And I was basically kind of auditioning for Olga for one of their parties that they were doing out in Oakland. Was it good times? It was good times. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Such a fun party back in the day. And yeah, I just remember her being at the very front, sitting at a table at Q bar and watching me DJ, which made it so much more stressful and I got so much more nervous because like it was like DJ OOT like you know they're like the DJ queer DJ in the Bay Area. I just remember being so supported by her and Mango going into that party for years you know it's just very special and I know I saw Olga go through a lot of challenges with her health through the years Being able to interview Olga at the festival and having her share kind of just her ups and downs through this last 10 years or so and really getting a better understanding of what community means to her was pretty special. So this is the interview with Olga T. What's the definition of wellness mean to you? I think that just generally people leaving me Alone, meaning like letting me be myself and letting, not feeling so judged all the time and having such high expectations put on me. Uh, Just being able to be, when that happens, it's, that's wellness to me. So what has your wellness journey been like for you as a queer person? And do you identify as as trans now? I guess trans-masculine, like... I just feel like I'm literally both. So if you call me he or you call me she, you're right either way. Like my brain is male and my body is a combination. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've gotten used to it. I think in my earlier years, it was very confusing because I thought I was a boy and I didn't get the memo that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then, you know, people, of course, let you know in very harsh ways. Uh, but still, I secretly just continued to think I was a boy and... Um, But then in the teenage years, when everybody kind of goes, you know, the guys hang out with the guys, Mm -hmm. the girls with the girls, and they date each other, that's when I really felt out of place. Like, I couldn't be with either. I couldn't hang out with the girls because I was too masculine, couldn't hang out with the guys because I'm not a guy. And I wasn't out until later. It's funny, I'm talking about the trans stuff instead, but (laughs) But I'm coming around to the fact that it's always been a struggle and a, a big part of me dealing with a lot of self-hate and not being well. <laughs> a lot of mental health stuff, uh, anger and frustration and shame. That's really been my experience a lot in the, the gay community and or queer community. And now that, you know, I'm older and wiser and I kind of just let things roll off and I finally got top surgery, I do feel way more grounded. I gotten away from the negativity that was causing a lot of anguish in my life. Uh, and it's really like certain in groups of people, and it was it was sad. That it was people within the uh, queer community, but just getting away from it really changed my life for the better. So people just leaving me alone—that's wellness to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you could, if you could use one word to describe wellness besides people leaving you the fuck alone, what would it be? I guess peace. By me saying leaving, you know, to leave me alone, it's it's definitely like if everyone would just be respectful of each other, we would all have peace. And it's really easy. So, yeah, constantly trying to get to that place and, and as situations come up to really challenge myself to find the route to peace, no matter how, you know, combative or 
or how much conflict there might be in the, uh, in the situation, but to figure out how to find the peaceful route. I guess it comes with age. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was just gonna say, as somebody who's gone through seeing the 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 community and evolve and you know over the years and change what has community brought for you well community has saved my life i guess because i lost my parents early teenage years uh i was uh, pretty much on my own by at 19 and so i had no family like all my family was in puerto rico uh, i had my siblings here but we were all struggling when the parents were gone and um pretty much all on the verge of homelessness. So just, you know, being in survival mode uh, in my 20s, the gay community, LGBTQ at the time, uh, they saved, or everybody saved me mm -hmm. by just helping me like whenever, whether, whether it was mental health stuff, whether it was advice, whether it was a job lead, uh, eventually with DJing, you know, just one thing led to the other. This person knows this person who knows me and and everybody, you know, just supporting each other. And then me kind of giving back by, for many years, I would say my first 10 years of DJing, just doing a lot of things for free or almost free um, because it just needed to be done. Like this event just needs a DJ or, and, and there's no point in charging and, and I enjoy it, you know, and, and it's, it's paying it forward. So yeah, it's, there's been a lot of difficult stuff within the community as well. I wouldn't say a lot, but there have been some challenges. Uh, and I had to kind of get away from the community. But at least in my in my 20s, I have to say that the community really had my back. And then I would say around the 2000s, everything just kind of started to change. And I guess, you know, I'm sure the politics and the economic uh, state of the world, or at least of this country, uh, things started, the disparity started getting wider and wider between the rich and the poor. And and that affects everybody. And so I felt that in those years. Felt like I was on my own and everybody was, you know, look out for number one. Now I feel like it's so interesting with the younger generation, to me is so grown compared to, and in terms of like being supportive of each other. And it's a beautiful thing to watch because I'm actually used to being judged mm. a lot by my community as well. And I have to say that in the younger community or the, the younger queers, they just got it together, you know? So the generation now that gets to be out and free and, uh, you know, be on TV and it's cool to be queer and the generation before, that would be me. We were fighting for that. And the, and the people before me were really fighting, like getting killed for that. We at least, uh, when I was coming up, we kind of already had, so those people that were sacrificing so much, all the people fighting for, you know, AIDS funding and support, uh, set it up for my generation to be able to DJ and have a whole queer world. Like I didn't even have to participate in the straight world once I got out of high school. Like uh, everything was just queer. No, I, I I agree. I think, you know, the the younger generations, millennials and you know, Gen, Gen uh, Z years. It was like they had this kind of built-in framework already because it was kind of built for them. Yes, yes, right. totally, yeah. 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 And I think between that, I guess having access to information yeah. via the internet mm -hmm. changed everything because so many people now, especially younger people, if they don't believe something or if something doesn't seem right, they can just look it up. They don't have to ask an older person yeah. or they can look it up for themselves. They can research everything and anything. And a lot of people trying to spread like, you know, just things that whether it's like, you know, Trump supporter types or even people in our community uh, perpetuating things that don't, not that it's not relevant, but that we've been tripping off of mm -hmm. <laughs> for no reason, like just made up reasons to like struggle. Yeah. I feel like the young people really question that and say, you know, we don't need that and we're throwing that away. I think it's that's great. They think for themselves. They don't really follow. 
Well, they do, I mean, to some degree. But when it comes to making decisions about their lives, I feel like a lot of the young people are just really saying, uh-uh. And I think that's amazing because it took me a long time to feel like I can say no, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I didn't even, I didn't even think about wellness. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was about survival. <laughs> that was wellness. I'm, I'm not on the street and I'm not dead. Yeah, no, wellness is, is super important. It's uh, taking care of yourself is everything. It starts with yourself. What's interesting, uh, I guess, about Olga particularly, I'm pretty sure when I came to campsite, she was like one of the first people that was there and like really helped me set up and stuff. She has a very happy-go-lucky energy about her. There's just something like infectious about Olga particularly. It's wild to think about what you don't know. Like that's none of the challenging stuff could have ever come off to me. I just saw, you know, somebody who's fucking awesome to be around and making me laugh and having a good time, hopefully making her laugh a little bit too. But it's wild. You never know. There's multitudes in everyone. Definitely. Even some of the stuff in her interview, I didn't really know much about that deeply about her. Literally, her interview made me cry. When she said the community saved her life, I'm trying to hold back my tears right now. I know what she means because you, you saw how the family was when I came out. You know, it wasn't very welcoming. The community out here became my family and made me feel accepted, made me feel loved when. I felt so rejected and I felt like there was something wrong with me. I didn't really know how to cope with all of that. So community also saved my life. So to hear her say that out loud and to hear that she's released so much of this anger and shame and is so much closer to authenticity, like became truly inspiring even more than where she already is being the big kid that she is at the age that she's at. It just she even she just became even more of a inspiration to me. It's so interesting when have a relationship with somebody, maybe it's professionally or, you know, in this specific case, you go to see a DJ in a club, right? Sometimes people have a different mask on or they have a different facade or they're kind of playing a part, right? And then when you get to sit up and close and talk to, at least for me, when I was able to talk to Olga, cause that was like the first time that we had ever got to sit down separate from the nightclub and just talk, you know? And that's how this, that interview really happened was like, we were just sitting at the campground talking and just catching up. And, you know, I hadn't seen Olga, like I mentioned, like for a couple of years and, for her to be so vulnerable and open was the first time I had ever really seen that from Olga before. You know, you're seeing somebody in their element and their artistic element, and it was so beautiful, you know, to really see that. I agree, B, I think she shed a lot of anger through the years, and I, I had a similar path myself. You know, I had a lot of anger for a lot of a lot of years for a lot of things that had happened in my life and, you know, getting sick and all those things, you know, just weighs you down. And she seems so much lighter in person. You can even, I think, hear it in her voice. And I think also kind of making that transition was such a huge, you know, weight lifted off of her. Yeah, yeah. And the top surgery, that's also other weights lifted off. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Body weight. She she just stands up so much taller now. It's so beautiful to see. Yeah, and I also got to interview Kenny, who we have coming up next. And Kenny and I also met in San Francisco Nightlife at a party called Cock Block. Yeah. For all the big old Bay Area folks that go back a few years, but that was kind of a, one of the big women lesbian focused queer focused dance parties in san francisco for a really long time and i might have met them at the same party <laughs> yeah i think we all met like at some point that same party and i met them with madison and uh i've seen penny go from their transition over the last couple of years and 
you know, you're going to hear it in the interview, but they're just such a, 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 a incredibly kind human being, just so generous. And I was always so attracted to their heart. Again, this interview at the festival happened very naturally. We we're just catching up and they were just saying so many amazing things about, you know, their transition. I was like, can you stop talking for a second? Because I just need to get this on tape. Are you cool with that? And they're like, totally cool. And I just started recording and yeah, like this was not a planned interview. This was just really nice and, you know, I hate to say it again, it just a very organic conversation that we had together, so. I love how all the interviews just ended up being like that. Just like, we're talking, we're like, wait, can we record this? <laughs> 100%. Uh, it's the yeah. best way to do it. Here's Kenny. Do you think the pandemic and having this time of separation, of, you know, disconnection from, you know, community and and you know all the things that we used to have as a queer community and then you transitioning do you think that had a had a, a major part in that or was was that journey already happening before the pandemic for me the journey started before the pandemic unbeknownst to me we are going to have a lockdown i actually did my first testosterone shot i think like the week or two weeks after we found out that like everything was shutting down and so I thought we were gonna be in a pan or in a lockdown for like a month, right? Like everyone else did. So I didn't ever think about, I'm a very private person. For me, I was always, I had to come to the realization of if society, if people, if all of this like didn't exist, what would I choose to do? And I was like, I would get top surgery and I would experiment with testosterone. And I say experiment in a way of like, I didn't know. Right. Like I had I don't know if anybody really knows how it's going to make them feel or or anything like some of the physical changes I do like and then some I don't. But, you know, that's genetics. So it just like it all comes with it. But being someone who is non-binary, I just like I didn't have answers for people. And I think that that's the hardest thing for people to grasp is they're like, so what's your end goal? I'm like, I don't have one. I really don't have one and I'm just like trying to experience life the best way that I can and be as present as I possibly can. I think that the pandemic gave me an opportunity to be by myself, but also be with my wife as well, because it was, it was hard. It was really hard, but I was also willing to lose my friends and my family by like coming out in that way or letting them in as some people say. So I think that the, in some ways, the, unfortunately, the lockdown, like it was a blessing for me um, because I got to experience it alone without having all this extra pressure from outside society. But now, or, and now like coming into society, everyone's like, oh, you look so different or this or that. Um, and so those are sometimes the scarier parts because a lot of the, the last time a lot of people saw me was at my wedding. And so like in person. And so there's almost like this, my comparison of like what, what I'm trying to compare it to now is like the before and after. And for some people, like it's like the before the pandemic and now, but like that was literally my timeline. Like that was my exact timeline was like before the pandemic and then like medical transition for me. But I feel like now I'm, I mean, you grow a lot in a couple of years, but I feel like I'm a completely different person in the way that I don't care as much anymore like what other people think or say and I feel like before I was very very self-conscious all the time anxiety ridden like every day so I sense I sense that about you and how that kind of has has shifted I could never understand that feeling of being so uncomfortable in your own body yeah and it's just amazing to hear you say that I was like in a cocoon and like came out like a butterfly. Like that's what it felt like. At least that's like my like description of it. It just, I was able to just like come into the world and be like, this is me now, bitches. <laughs> like take it or leave it. I don't care. I don't care. Wow, wow, wow. This is a prime example of what I was saying about the darkness brings out the light. You know, pandemic gave them the privacy to become closer to whom they are 
and how they want to represent. And now being able to do that, they're able to release like all this anxiety and not really give a shit what people think. And living so authentically, like I hadn't seen them since before their transition and they were just shining so bright. I was like, what are you doing? I want to do it. <laughs> yeah, Kenny is like an inspiration. Like it's just like a little tea to like in person. Kenny probably shed 50 pounds off of them in just their their sense of their power and their confidence, not in the physical pounds, but just that weight. I'm so proud of Kenny. They're going to be a parent. And if they're not a parent already, their partner, Kaylin, was pregnant. And they, I think they have popped out the baby at some point recently or will be coming up soon. But yeah, it was really cool to catch up to see what that next step was going to be for the, both of them as well. Yeah, definitely. And these two interviews combined together and these two humans combined together have really inspired me because I am very fearful of what my family thinks and what people think, but I've always wanted top surgery, not necessarily to transition, but to have top surgery. I just keep meeting such beautiful, beautiful humans that have gone through it and are just standing up so much taller and just so much happier to have these two in the same episode just gives me even more hope. (laughs) <laughs> snaps snaps amazing snaps to kenny olga and your future transition e. the... <laughs> no, that's I'm great choking up over here <laughs> <laughs> if all of us don't cry at some point then we're <laughs> then not doing we? something <laughs> right <laughs> and our next episode of the quest podcast we will be exploring play so get ready for some fun y'all We're diving into how play positively impacts our well-being and mental health. And to examine that, we are talking to two incredibly gifted artists, Jacques the Stripper, a comedian, actor, and as well as DJ CLA, who is an international DJ and a sound healer. These two people are super incredible, and we can't wait for you to hear about their quest to wellness. All right, our dear queer kittens and allies, thank you so much for listening to Quest and a very, very special thank you to DJ Olga T and Kenny for letting us share your story with our community. We have so much more to explore and share with you on our podcast, and we hope you follow us in our quest to wellness. Tap that follow or subscribe button to get every episode as soon as it's released. And we'd love to get your feedback also. So if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, leave us a rating and review. It only takes 30 seconds, but this really helps us to know what resonates and how we can help you. All right. Goodbye, she's, he's, they's, gays, and allies. I love that. (laughs) This podcast was produced in collaboration by Kanoko Chocolates and Puka Puka Creative. Executive producers, Stevie Kwa and Corey Houston. Producer, writer, editor, and sound designer, the amazing Leah Jackson. And associate producer, Rafaela Landestoy. Original music was produced by Basque. He is an amazing musician, and he's also our cousin, third amigo. Let's go. Boo, 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 boo. Bow, bow, bow. And we can't forget the emotional support by Frankie, Ruby, the Braithwaite Kittens, Meow. and Pukalani. Yay! Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> For your brain not being at full capacity, you did fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're a superstar. Thank you. I appreciate it. Pod- the next podcast store. It's chaos in here. Mm, <laughs> no. I just want to hug it. I just want to hug all the chaos. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Queer hug Aww. all around. <laughs> Receiving it. Taking it in. <laughs> Keep breathing. Breathe deep breaths. You can make it. Yeah. Deep breathing. Yeah. That's a... That's a must. That goes a long way.